אוקיי, צהריים טובים, good afternoon. My name is Yoram, I will start my presentation in a moment. I want to check with you a little bit just to get a sense of the class. Is there anyone here who is not in the Airtech program? Okay, so can you just tell me what background you're from or what program you're on? So everyone here. Uh, yes, I should uh, in fact. Um, is there anyone here who is in charge of uh, reminding the speakers to do it or uh, no? Okay. Uh, I think the, the everything here is recorded uh, by default, but there is a microphone somewhere and I don't know where it is. Um, which is helpful because otherwise sometimes the the audio recording is not very good. Maybe it's uh, maybe it's uh, with Nili. Maybe maybe Nili has it. Uh, if, if someone wants to go and check with her, uh, so might help. Um, so everyone here took uh, Jonathan's course. Uh, uh, well, you know, this course is now we call it theoretical and computational neuroscience, but it's for many years it was called uh, 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 neural networks one and two, the two courses. So. I still confuse the names sometimes. But we decided to change the names because uh, we think that the topics are not really all on neural networks. So I will tell you, I will start to talk uh, in a moment about the topic of the, of the course today. Let's see if this is connecting. Okay, so uh, let's start with some uh, administrative things. Uh, now you see my full name. Uh, I sit physically in two places. One of them is the uh, Rakach Institute of Physics, uh, and one of them is here on this floor. And so I'm part of the time there and part of the time here if you want to look for me. I think that uh, during this semester I will, roughly speaking, be um, here on Tuesdays to Thursdays. Uh, and I didn't set up a formal meeting hour because I'm here a lot of the time on this floor. So you're very welcome to come and talk with me. Uh, and just, you know, if I'm busy, I will tell you, let's set up some t time later, but, uh, or, you, or just send me an email before, but, but you can just stop by and we will find a time to talk if you want to. And uh, the teaching assistant is Neta, Neta Ravid Tenenbaum. Um, and, um, she will probably talk with you about uh, uh, how she plans to do things. Um, actually, this slide is adapted from last year, so this part, uh, I'm not sure about it. Last year, we had an extra uh, hour, which the goal of that extra hour was to help mostly the students without a strong mathematical background, okay? By the way, so that's a good time to ask, how many people here studied in undergraduates uh, mathematical sciences, math, physics, computer science? Okay, how many did not study? Okay, so it's, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's the usual situation. A, a bit this year, I think there's maybe a slightly larger percentage of people with a math mathematical background, uh, but it's usually about half and half. And so the idea is that uh, uh, this course is, uh, 
course, it's a, it's a very mathematical course, uh, maybe even a bit more so than uh, uh, Neural Networks 1. And so for the students that do not come from a strong mathematical background, it's, it's, a, it's a really uh, challenging course. Um, and um, um, I think that you will need to work hard in order to, to keep up with the course. Um, hopefully it will also be interesting for you. Uh, and um, I think that um, in addition to learning something about the specific topics that we teach uh, in this course, especially for those who don't come from a mathematical background, uh, this, the goal of this course is to expose you a little bit to the way of thinking when we think mathematically, when we use theoretical tools to think about uh, the brain, and I think that this is extremely important both for those who will continue in their PhD to do something which is theoretical, but also for those who will do uh, experimental work. Um, this will give you an ability to, to at least uh, communicate with people who think about theoretical questions. Okay, so um, there is a Moodle site for the, for the course. I, I don't think that I didn't yet open it, so I should do it later uh, today, hopefully. And I will also put there the uh, presentation that, uh, that I'm showing you today. Most of the course will be on the whiteboard. It will not be uh, a slide. And uh, you see here something about the, the, the grade. Uh, we will have uh, homework assignments. The assignments are extremely important, and they're a significant amount of work. Um, you will submit them roughly once every two weeks. Um, so there will be six to seven homework assignments. I hope that it will be seven this, this semester. Uh, and um, that's part of the final uh, um, grade, and, and the rest is the final exam. Any questions so far? Okay. So what I will do uh, today um, is um, mostly this um, slide presentation. I want to first talk a little bit quite general about the brain um, to just make sure that we have common uh, grounds, common terminology. Um, many of the things that I will say are things that many of you know, okay? But, but still, I think it's important to do that. After talking a little bit about the brain and some very basic concepts, uh, we will talk, I will talk a little bit about a certain view of the brain or a certain set of questions that some people ask about the co uh, brain. Uh, I will talk about computational neuroscience, which will still be broader than the con what we will do in this course. And then I will tell you a little bit about uh, what we were going to, the plan for what we're going to do in the next uh, 13 or 14 weeks. Okay, so uh, let's start uh, with some very basic concepts and terms. Uh, starting from a neuron. So uh, a neuron, as you know, is a biological cell, first, first and foremost, and like every biological cell uh, it, uh, in, the, in, the, uh, in eukaryotes, it has a, it has a, a, a nucleus and, and so on, and all the organelles that a biological cell has. But what is very different, what is striking about neurons is that uh, in addition to the cell body, which is called the soma, so you can see it here for a few, for a new, few neurons, which is kind of the typical size of a biological cell. They have extremely large uh, um, processes, the, the, the dendrites and the, and the axons that project for a long uh, distance. And uh, so I discussed the soma. The soma is the, the body of the cell, and then every neuron has an axon, which, as we'll dis we will discuss in a moment, is an output. Is a way that the neuron communicates, provides input to other neurons. And it has a um, um, dendrite, sometimes more than one dendrite, as you can see in this cell, the apical dendrite and the basal dendrite. Uh, and the dendrite can be uh, very, very um, uh, branchy. Okay? Um, do you know what are typical lengths of axons and, uh, and dendrites? Uh, say an axon, how, how long can it be? Okay, so, we'll go, so that's a good example, right? If we think about our own body, there are axons that go through, through our uh, spinal cord, right? And so that, that our size is uh, about 
order of one meter, so axons can be one meter long, dendrites are, are much uh, shorter, uh, typically, uh, millimeter. So we will, maybe we will, if, if I don't mention, discuss why that's the case, maybe ask me the question later. Um, and, uh, okay, from our point of view, from uh, thinking, we want to think about the brain computationally, um, neurons are the basic uh, computational unit of the brain, although you can argue that maybe compartments of the neurons are the basic com computational units. Um, but from our point of view, this will be, be how we will think about it. Uh, neurons receive electrical inputs from other neurons, uh, and these are mediated by synapses, as we will discuss in a moment. And in response to the inputs that they receive from other neurons, what a neuron does is it decides to, at some point in it, every now and then, to, do, to produce a spike. Uh, so we'll go into a bit more depth about that. So what is a spike? Um, the spike has to do with the dynamics of the membrane potential of the neuron, the, the difference in voltage or pot electric potential between the inside of the membrane and the outside of the membrane. That's the most important degree of freedom, of dynamical degree of freedom of what's going on in a, in a neuron. And uh, this potential is determined, is varying because of the flow of ions. And ions flow, as you know, uh, through ion channels and also through pumps. Okay. And so the dynamics of flow of ions controls, affects the membrane potential. And so our view is going to be, um, you know, we'll actually, in this course, we will deal very little uh, with, with explicitly with spiking, so, but, but, but it's important, nevertheless, to, to mention this. Maybe towards the end of the course, we'll discuss a little bit uh, some questions. Well, actually, some of the course, we will discuss spikes. So, so, um, so roughly speaking, um, when the membrane potential of a neuron goes up beyond a certain value, a series of very nonlinear uh, um, um, processes takes place, which have to do with opening and closing of ion channels. And these happens over a time course of about one millisecond. And it's almost like a process that you cannot stop. Once, you, once this starts to happen, you have you know, opening of sodium channels, uh, closing of other, opening of other channels, and, and that causes flow of ions, which causes a very stereotypical time course, the membrane potential, which you see here, and this is the spike. Okay. So you see here that over a time of about one millisecond, the membrane potential goes up very rapidly, and then it goes down, it goes below the, the typical membrane potential of the cell, and then it goes back to baseline. Okay. So this is a very non-linear dynamic process. We will not discuss it explicitly in this course, but you, one can model it using, say, the Hodgkin-Huxley equation. And uh, from our point of view, uh, uh, that's the way that neurons communicate. I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit more in a moment. Uh, and once a spike is generated, one, uh, once a, a, a spike is initiated, it travels along the axons and it provides input to other uh, neurons, the, the, the postsynaptic partners of the neuron. Now, um, uh, one of the very basic assumptions that most people make in neuroscience, so I will even call it a dogma, is that the way neurons communicate through each other, uh, with each other is through just the timing of the spikes. So what I mean by that is that the shape of the spike does not carry information. The shape of the spike is very stereotypical, okay? And so the, what this dogma says, and it's not, it's not precise reality, but what this dogma says is that if we know what are the times at which the spikes were emitted, we know everything that this neuron is telling to its postsynaptic partners. It's not providing information to its postsynaptic partners by, say, varying the amplitude or the duration of the spike. We will adopt this uh, dogma, and most people do. Um, just important to keep in mind that this is an assumption that we're making. Remember that. Uh, it's backed up by a lot of, a lot of empirical evidence, but the, uh, mainly the fact that the shape of the spike does not vary much. But, but nevertheless, one can ask whether argue with it, argue with this assumption. Okay. Now, um, let's talk a little bit about what's happening in synapses. So, 
uh, in our brain, most of the connections between neurons are through chemical synapses. Uh, and um, so here you see um, an axon meeting a, a, a dendrite. So remember the axon is the input, the dendrite is the output. The axon is providing information to, to the postsynaptic cell which on through the dendrite. And what happens in a synapse is that, uh, curiously, the, the signal, so uh, as we discussed, uh, the, the most of the flow of information in neurons is electrical. It has to do with the electrical potential. But in the synapse, the electrical signal is turned into a chemical signal and back to a, an electrical signal. And this happens in, in the following way, that uh, as the spike reaches the, the synapse, this causes a release of uh, vesicles. These vesicles are kind of in, over in, in this area. The, what is a vesicle? It's a kind of a membrane that engulfs, engulfs some, uh, some chemical, which we call a neurotransmitter. And um, uh, the, the spike causes these vesicles to merge with the membrane of the, of the cell, release the neurotransmitter into the space between uh, the two neurons. And this neurotransmitter reaches receptors on the dendrite, and these receptors, due to the to to the to the neurotransmitter, they ch open or close some ion channel, and so the opening and the closing of the or the closing of the ion, ion channel causes flow of ions, and that turns the the chemical signal back into a change in the membrane potential, so it turns it back into a, a an ele electrical signal. Okay. Um, this is just a beautiful electron microscopy image in which you can actually see you know, a vesicle merging with a membrane uh, and releasing its neurotransmitter. Um, so as we said, uh, the signal turns from electrical to chemical and back to electrical. Uh, and now, depending on the type of, uh, of ion channels that uh, the type of synapse. So the type of synapse means um, uh, what kind of receptors you have here and what kind of neurotransmitter is, is released here. And so the receptors can have different types of, uh, of uh, channels. And depending on the channel, which types of ions are flowing, uh, the, the, the effect of the activation of the synapse can be a depolarizing the, the cell or hyperpolarizing the cell, increasing the membrane potential or decreasing the, the membrane potential. And so uh, Increasing the membrane potential makes it more likely for the cell to generate a spike. So a synapse that does that, we call it excitatory, because the spike increases the likelihood of the postsynaptic cell to in itself generate a, a spike. And if, uh, if the uh, synapse causes a reduction in the membrane, more negative membrane potential, then the cell will be less likely to produce a spike, so it inhibits uh, the, the spiking activity. So we call this kind of synapses uh, uh, inhibitory synapses. And um, uh, one of the, you know, in biology, there almost every rule has exceptions, but a rule which is quite well followed in the brain is that at least most neurons um, form one type of synapse to their postsynaptic partners. So they are either excite all their postsynaptic neurons or inhibit all their postsynaptic neurons. And therefore, a very important division of neurons is into excitatory neurons which form excitatory synapses into the postsynaptic uh, synapses or in inhibitory neurons. A neuron can receive, and most neurons do receive, both excitatory and inhibitory uh, synapses, but they project their, their output is either excitatory or inhibitory. Okay, um, so, um, so this leads us to a very simplified view of uh, what a neuron uh, does. Um, the neuron receives uh, input in the form of spikes, now, one thing I didn't talk about much is that once the synapse is activated, there is some increase in the membrane potential, okay? And this has to do with flow of ions. And roughly speaking, it's not precise. We, can, we will suppose that what neurons are doing is they're summing up their, their, their inputs in, with some, in, some linear, in a linear fashion, okay? that reflects the strength of the synapses that they receive. So what is the strength of the synapse? It has to do with the, 
uh, amount of neuron transmitter which is released in the synapse. It has to do with the um, uh, how many receptors there are and, and so on. But we can measure it by asking what is the current, the electrical current that is generating once the synapse is activated. So we're going to view the neurons as if they're summing up their inputs in a linear fashion, but with weights that depend on the strength of the synapses. And somehow, based on this linear sum, uh, the neurons decide when to produce a spike. Now we can model this in, in various levels of complexity, this decision process, this part. We can model it using very detailed modeling of the electrical processes that are happening in a neuron, say with the Hodgkin-Huxley equation, and with very detailed dimensions, or we can model it in much more uh, simplified ways, which is the way that we were going to do things in this course. But the neuron, again, receives uh, inputs, sums them up, and decides when to, when to produce a spike. And in fact, uh, uh, in this course, most of the time, uh, we will even simplify this part even further by saying that this linear sum that the neuron receives determines the rate in which the neuron is generating spikes. Okay? And that's all we will care about, the rate at which the neuron is generating spikes. Okay. Um, so this is what I wrote here. Um, yes. So um, the the electrical properties of the dendrites are, are very typically very linear. So you can show that if you uh, say excite the dendrites uh, in different places, the output that you will get in the soma will be a sum of the of the um, say the, the the, the inputs that you provide to the dendrites in different positions. Now, there are some nonlinearities which are more complicated because what the activation of the synapse does is it generates a current. And the current itself depends on the voltage of the cell. So if, w when, if I would want to say that it's precisely linear, I'd want to say that, say, the change in the voltage of the cell is a linear sum of contributions from all the inputs. That's a bit oversimplified. So, no, no, so the cell receives, so the, re the, the sigmoidal part is the relationship between the input and the cell of the cell and the rate at which it is, say, spiking, okay? The, the, that's very nonlinear. So the neuron sums up its input. The picture that we're going to have is that the neuron sums up its input, its input in a linear fashion, and then this part is nonlinear, okay? This part, so the decision based on this aggregate of inputs that it's receiving from, from all the its presynaptic inputs, now the rate at which it's, gen it's generating spikes can be a nonlinear function of that, but everything is aggregated into one variable, which is a linear sum over the input. Okay. Any other questions? All right. So now what I want to just to do is to just to give you a flavor of the, the level at which I'm going to discuss neural dynamics, and write something mathematically, and you should have seen similar concepts, similar equations in the in uh, the first course, in the uh, in see, I still got neural networks one. <laughs> what? Yeah, yeah. We we c we came up with a name which is more correct, but it's more difficult to say. So so we still say neural networks one and two. Uh, so um, so this is a typical way in which I'm going to think about uh, uh, neural dynamics. I wish I had a pointer. Um, I don't have a pointer. Okay. Uh, I can I can manage without it. Uh, thanks. So uh, I will just use this. So um, so this is a typical uh, equation which we might use to describe the dynamics of a neuron. What we're going to say is that the neuron. So I, I I should explain what are the variables that you see here. So. Uh, um, S J represents the activation of a synapse going out of neuron J. Okay, out of neuron J, and neuron I sums up these activations with some weights, J I J. So this represents the strength at which an, a spike incoming from the uh, at, at which activation of the synapse generates uh, uh, some output in the cell, and we have here some 
in addition to the sum, there is some constant here, which you can think of as some either feed-forward inputs to the cell, which is not, we're not explicitly modeling it as part of our network. So we have here a network of cells, and, and we're representing the, eventually the firing rate of the cell I is determined by the activation of all these other J cells, but there might be some other feed-forward inputs that we're not modeling explicitly. Or this variable could act just represent some intrinsic property of the cell, its excitability. The larger this variable will be, the cell will fire at a higher rate. And now all this linear sum, as we discussed, so this is linear, but the, the firing rate of the cell is going to be some nonlinear function of this sum. Okay? So all this sum goes into some nonlinear function. And that determines, in our model, the firing rate of the cell. Now, what does this function phi have to obey? What are, or what do we expect for that it will look like? Not necessarily. Okay, so first of all, it's certainly not zero and one because uh, in the way I wrote it, this is a firing rate, and firing rate has dimensions of a uh, rate. So when we, if you say zero and one, it's... Yeah, but between but one what one hertz, one uh, kilohertz. So you should uh, if you if you if if phi represents a firing rate, it has to have units of uh, of firing rate. What are typical firing rates of neurons? Depends. Yeah. If, right. So recording in the cortex, typically one finds that cells most cells fire at most I don't know the order of 10 hertz. Uh, it's rare to find uh, 100 hertz uh, in the cortex. But in other areas, we can find neurons that fire more rapidly. So in the retina, neurons in the retina um, fire, typically when they fire vigorously, it's an order of 100 hertz. Okay. Anyway, but so I, I was asking, what does this function phi, uh, what, can we exp what are the basic properties that we can expect from it? Hmm? Okay. Yeah, no negative is the most important thing because it's supposed to represent a firing grade and a firing grade cannot be negative, right? And what else, maybe? It's monotonic. Yeah, monotonic. Yeah. I mean, it's not obvious, but it makes sense that the stronger the input to the cell, the, the higher the firing grade will be. So, um, well, be it might be bounded, yes. It, it must be bounded, right? A neuron certainly cannot fire at 10,000 hertz. Right? So, um, but when we choose, when we uh, write mathematical models of neurons, these are the, the two first properties that are the most fundamental, basic, that always we will put them in. This phi is non-negative and it's monotonically increasing. And the most simple kind of non-linearity that we might use is this one, which is just, you know, when the input is below zero, it's just zero, and when it's below, ab above zero, it's linear. But uh, we could also use other models, like sigmoidal or something like that. All right. So now, but I, I said that this is a mathematical representation of neural dynamics, and I didn't, and there's no dynamics here. What I wrote here is just a relationship between the synaptic activation of, of all the neurons in the network and the firing rate of all the neurons in the network. But we should now think about these SJs, maybe also these B, the things that we, which can be fu function of time, and therefore R is also a function of time. And the crucial, um, a, a, an important equation which is written here tells us that the synaptic activation, the activation of a synapse going out of neuron J is related to the refining rate of neuron J. But you see here that it's not just an equality, it's not SJ equal to RJ. So can someone tell me what this uh, differential equation represents in simple terms? So if I have some signal, if I have some, so look, let's think about this equation as relating some input, R, to an output, S. I tell you what is R as a function of T, and through this differential equation, S is determined. And now what I want you to tell me is uh, what is, in words, what does this tell us about the relationship between S and R? So again, we have some, if I tell you what is R of T, what will be S of T, which is the solution of this equation, tau ds to dt is equal to minus S plus R. How can we describe in words the relation, 
So I, I wrote the relationship. This is a di this differential equation. If you tell me what is R, I can tell you what will be F. I solve this differential equation and I find the solution. But can you tell, say in words what this equation does? How, what, is the, what is the kind of relationship that you get between S and R? Yes? Yes. Okay. So, so, so I, I actually I, I didn't put this on the slide, but I it's it's uh, for s actually I, based on the responses, I t maybe it's not clear to um, to many of you. The, the, the someone do, of you, what does one of you think that you do know the answer? Yes. Good, okay, so that's a good point to bring up that uh, it, at least one thing that we know is that if R does not depend on time, then S is simply equal to R in this equation, right? Because then the, le the left hand will be zero. But, um, but I want to discuss what happens if S does depend on time. So the way to think about, uh, uh, about this is the following. You we can understand, th this equation is a linear equation. This is a linear differential equation. What does this mean? It means that if I provide to this equation, so now we're, we're doing a little bit of math, but the, but the outcome will be some understanding of what this equation tells us. So if, if we think about this equation again as generating an input-output relationship between R of t and S of t. Now let's, I, I, what I want to point out is this, this, this relationship has some properties. If say, R of t is a sum of two things, alpha 1 R1 of t and alpha 2 R2 of t, then what can we say about the, out sorry, sorry, I wanted to write S. S. If S of t is a sum It's not readable? It's maybe also helpful to open the light here for until, until I, we finish this. And also, let's see. This is better? Uh, okay. So I will write everything again. Okay, so we have this differential equation, S of t, d to dt, is equal to uh, uh, tau to dt is minus S of t plus R of t. And I want to think about this as, as an input-output relationship between R of t and S, between a, a R of t and S of t. Okay, so now, what one property of this equation is that suppose that R of t is a sum of two contributions, alpha 1 R1 of t plus alpha 2 R2 of t. What can we say about the, out, the S of t? Because of linearity. Suppose that I know, okay, suppose that I know what R1 of t generates as S of t, as 1 of t. And R2 of t generates S2 of t. What can I say about the outcome that I will get if R is this, is this combination? It will be alpha 1. So this will generate, this R of t will generate an S of t, which is alpha 1 S1 of t plus alpha 2 S2 of t. This is a co consequence of the linearity. The other property of this equation which is very important which is important is what we call a, a time invariance or a stationarity if i know what is the if s of t generates an output which is r of t and now i provide sorry it's r to s not s to r r to r to s yes r of t generates an s, s of t and now i provide to the same differential equation an input which is just translated in time what will be the output? Ah, <laughs> thanks for telling me. So what we will do is I will just uh, bring this up and we'll finish this point and uh, continue.
Okay. So if S of T, if uh, R of T generates a, a S of T, and now I provide as the as the input to the synapse a, a trans something which is just starts at a different time, what will be the output? S of T plus tau. So this is what I would call stationarity. The stationarity arises because this equation does not have time in it explicitly anywhere. I mean, it's the, of course, S and R depends of, on T, but there's no, en nowhere else, the, the way the equation looks like is the same at any time. So if I just delay the input, I will delay the output in the same manner. Now these two properties, so this is linearity, and this is stationarity. But these two properties mean that we can understand everything about this e differential equation by just understanding what is the response to an impulse. So if I understand, if I provide an, a, an R of t, which is just what we call a delta function, an impulse, delta function, is that uh, familiar to everyone? Yes, okay. So if we provide a, a delta function, If we know what that generates, we really know everything that we need to know about this equation because we can think now about any other more complicated R of t as a sum of many delta functions. And so if we know what each one of these delta functions generates as the output, we can also tell what any other function would generate as an output. Now, so the question is now, what is, this differential what is the solution of this differential equation when R of t is a delta function? Anybody knows? So if to this equ differential equation we provide an R of t which is a delta function, an impulse at time zero, what will S of t look like? Yes? And if there would be a set, uh, at time Okay, and then what? It will, uh, decay. It exponentially decay. And the time constant of the decay is this tau that appears here. You see that tau has dimensions of time because S and R, the, the way we define it, have the same dimensions. Here we have derivative with respect to time, so the dimensions here are 1 over time. And so in order for this and this term to have the same dimensions, tau has to have dimensions of time. So tau is really the time, the characteristic, the characteristic time over which uh, this, uh, this solution decays. So what we conceptually c think about is that what this equation really represents is the fact that when a spike arrives at the synapse, the, say, the voltage which is generated on the postsynaptic cell immediately jumps and then decays exponentially over some characteristic time. Now, in reality, that's not true. Reality, um, how does the voltage look like when the spike arrives? The postsynaptic uh, voltage? What, what is wrong about this? Uh, there's, no there's no immediate jump. It rises, it rises maybe that, like this, and then it decays. But roughly speaking, this is, so this is a, a, an idealization, a simplification of what's happening in reality. So this is like assuming that the rise time is very fast and the decay time is slower. What determines the decay time? Yeah, but what it, bio biophysically, what determines the time constant? The, even properties of the synapse, right, the ion channels, um, you know, how long, and also on things like how long the neurotransmitter lingers, you know, in the vicinity of the, after it's released. So, so there are various biophysical processes that affect this time constant, but do you know what are, what are the typical time constants uh, uh, for synapses? Anyone wants to guess or, or, to, or to propose an answer for typical time constants of synapses? 10 milliseconds is a good answer. So 10 milliseconds would be um, 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 you know, for, for, a, for a, um, 
AMPA for um, for some excitatory synapses um, and and other synapses are slower. So, for example, NND NMDA synapses, which are excitatory synapses, uh, are are slower. Okay. Um, um, uh, AMPA will be about 10 milliseconds. Inhibitory synapses are typically a bit faster, a few milliseconds. But this gives you an idea for the time concept. So the point is that when a spike arrives at the synapse, the output in terms of the, say, the membrane potential of the postsynaptic cell is lingers for a certain characteristic time, which is this tau. Now, going back formally to the equations, we discussed what is the output of this equation when we provide an input which is a pulse. Mathematically, if we provide an input which is some function of time, we can think about the output. So if this is R of t, we can think about um, the S of t uh, as, you know, mathematically, can someone say what is the mathematical real operation? that I need to do to calculate R of T from S of T? Like convolution. convolution. Wonderful. So, I mean, one thing, one way to, re if I tell you what is R of T, one way to do it is to just solve this equation. But we can express immediately the solution by saying that R of T is a convolution. So let's call this, uh, this uh, impulse response uh, G of T, this exponential. It's an exponent. Uh, it's an exponent uh, of uh, minus t over tau. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm running out of space here. So it's an uh, exponent of minus t over tau. I should put here a theta of t because theta is a heavy side function. It's 0 for t smaller than 0, and it's uh, 1 for t larger than 0. And I think that I should put here also 1 over tau to give this a correct uh, prefactor. So this is this function, which is zero before the pulse and it's exponential after the pulse. And if I give you a, a, some, some any, rand, any R of t, then the S of t that will be generated can be written formally as a convolution of G of t and R of t, which is like imagining that you take the R of t you break it up into many delta functions, many impulses. You know what is the response to all each one of these impulses. So it's like for each one of these impulses, you generate something which is an exponential. This one is larger. And then you sum up all these things. This is what the convolution does. Now, I will not go into additional details on this. I'm, I'm supposed that for some of you, this is more clear. Maybe, maybe for some of you, it's very clear. And maybe for some of you, it's confusing what I've said. So I will just ask uh, Neta to have uh, some exercise that will clarify these points. But just to sum up, the idea is that I was just trying to explain these equations that I had on the, on the, on the, on the whiteboard, that a time-dependent synaptic activation, uh, sorry, a time-dependent firing rate of the presynaptic cell generates a time-dependent synaptic activation in the postsynaptic cell which is related to it. It's related to it linearly, but it has this time delayed effect, which is, has to do with the time course of the synaptic activation. Okay, so let's go back to the uh, equations. And after that, oops, after that, no. Uh, this is, I think this is enough. No, but I want to. Okay, let's leave it like this. Uh, I want to go through these equations and then we will take a break. That will take a another moment.
while this is happening, while we're waiting, I want to take a picture of all of you because this helps me remember the names. <laughs> so just everyone <laughs> smile. Okay, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not catching all of you yet. Okay, hopefully it's okay. Okay, so now we can continue with the equations. So, we were just discussing this equation and what I was conveying to you is that we really can interpret, this is written as a differential equation, but the more important, but the more um, physical or biophys physical way to think about it is through this convolution, that, that the input in terms of the firing rate of the presynaptic uh, cell generates a synaptic activation, which is kind of a smeared version of that. Whenever there is a spike, it generates something which is lingers on for a while over a time scale of tau, and this is what is conveyed to the postsynaptic cell, because this Sj is uh, entering into the postsynaptic cell, but with the weight. The weight is the strength of the synapse, which we kind of did not put explicitly here. Okay, and, um, and so now if we take these two equations, this equation and this equation, we can write down dynamic equations for the synaptic variables. Right, because we just take this equation and we plug in the expression for R, which is this phi, and I, I replace the role of the index J in the index, uh, 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 in, in the index I, but that, that's fine. So, um, and here I just wrote it with the index I, and then I plugged in this, and so we get a differential equation. We get a set of differential equations, like the, what is the number of equations? as a number of neurons. And by the way, the, the reason that it's, that it's a number of neurons, I, these are really equations for the synapses, not for the neurons. But we assume that uh, you know, all the synapses coming from out of one neuron are, have the same properties, which is not that necessarily has to be the case. So if we assume that all the synapses are coming out of the same neuron decay with the same time constant, we c and we actually assume here that all the synapses in the network have the same time constant. We can, we can generalize it, but I just want to give you an idea. If that's the case, we can just write a set of equations where the number of equations is like the number of synapses, but also like the number of, well, it's a number of neurons, really, but it, it, we, we, all the synapses coming out of each neuron are the same, and this is what is represented by this variable, Si. If you wanted to model a system where this, there are different properties of different synapses coming out of the same neuron, we would need to have equations that have two indices on the variables because if the, the synapses, then it would matter both from which cell the synapse is going and to what cell it's going. But here we, we simplified it in this way. Anyway, so we can get, we get a set of differential equations. And this is a very typical uh, way to model neural dynamics. This is what people call rate, neural rate models. Have you encountered equations that look like this? Yes. So, um, yeah. So this is the type, this is mostly the level of description that we will use uh, in this course. We will not describe neural dynamics using, say, the Hodgkin-Huxley equation, or not even the integrate and fire model. We will use these rate equations. Even more, more so, in many cases, we will not consider dynamics at all, and we will just ask um, um, what is the steady state firing rate of a network given some inputs. So we might think about the inputs to the networks actually as embodied in these BIs, okay? Or in some subset of the, of the, of the neurons. And its steady state, as was pointed out earlier, RI is just equal to SI, and we have a set of algebraic equations. If I tell you what are all the BIs, um, uh, we can write here just as well SI, and you, can, you have here a set of algebraic equations that you need to solve in order to find the relationship, say, be between the Bs and the Ss, okay? So many, m much of the time we'll discuss steady state properties, relationship between some fixed input and fixed output. I think um, we should take a break now. Um, let's see, it's uh, 10 minutes before one, so let's reconvene at uh, five minutes after one.
I will mention uh, some books, although I, I will not teach uh, from a book. No, but like what is the book? Like the kind of yeah, yeah, this I will mention. These are notes from last year. Uh, these are not. These are my slides from last year. No, but they are notes from ah. from the student class. Like for example, in the normal lesson one, we had notes from previous year. I don't know. Um, oh. there, there's no, there are no notes that I'm uh, oh. aware of, um, but there might be. Uh, okay. So might be a good idea to ask around.
we ventured into a little bit of writing equations, or adding things mathematically, but the rest of this, uh, I think, today, the rest will be slides and, con and more concepts. Um, so we go back to, to neurobiology, and um, uh, I want to discuss a few more uh, simple concepts. So the first one is, um, so we, we discussed the fact that the, the way neurons communicate with each other is by sending spikes, and so a ba very basic uh, fundamental question in computational neuroscience is to understand what these spikes uh, represent, what is, what is the information conveyed by the spikes. And the, a classic way to look at this question is, uh, say, in some sensory area where we might um, provide some stimulus to, to the to one of our senses, say to, to the retina or to some auditory stimulus, and um, we might measure the activity of uh, some cell in response, some cell in the brain or, or maybe even in, in the retina, the activity of the cell in response to, to the stimulus. And, and much of the, the research in, uh, in neuroscience, um, in and this is something which is changing now. Uh, one, much of the research in, in neuroscience has focused on, on responses of single cells. So imagine that you look at the, so actually the, 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 the example that I have here is say the experiments um, uh, of Hubert and Wiesel. They were trying to figure out what causes a, a cell in the V1, in the primary visual cortex, to fire, and they tried to present ve various uh, stimuli to visual stimuli, and, and they actually found it hard to, to understand or even to elicit spikes until they realized that uh, cells in the visual cortex really like to respond to bars, to something which has a clear orientation, and sometimes you need to move the bar a little bit in order to elicit a response. But you know, if you would provide a, a, a dot, you would get much much weaker uh, response. But if you provide a bar, you get very stereotypical responses and strong responses. But the responses depend on uh, the orientation of the bar. Okay, so first of all, they depend also on where the bar is. So if a particular cell would respond respond to a bar in a particular region of the visual uh, scene, and the response depends also on the orientation. So this is just, these images are just images of, actually of, of spike frames generated by the cell. So when the bar is oriented like this, nothing happens. When it's oriented like this, the cell fires like crazy, okay? So this cell responds to the orientation this way. And then, so you can plot, you can measure the firing rate of the cell as a function of the orientation. And this is what is called a tuning curve, tuning curve, okay? And then um, this is a characteristic typical uh, tuning curve to orientation. Does this mean that spikes in V1 represent the orientation of bars? Some of you are shaking your head. And, uh, well, the activity of cells in the V1 represents the orientation of bars. Well, it responds, the cell, these cells respond vigorously to oriented bars, but of course they respond also to many other stimuli. So. We here we're really showing, w does this mean that the cell is encoding orientation of bars? No, because this is what we're providing to it. We're doing an experiment in which what we're varying, the only thing that we're varying is the orientation of the bar, and then we can characterize the strength of response. But sometimes people who kind of start to think about it uh, a bit too, in a too oversimplified way, into saying that this is, you know, this is the response of the cell. The cell encodes the orientation of oriented bars. Of course not. It, it responds to many other stimuli, and the visual stimulus is a highly multidimensional stimulus. The visual stimulus is the strength of light intensity following the, every one of the photoreceptors in our, in our retina. It's a much higher dimensional than one dimensional that you see here. Nevertheless, it's sometimes, once we identify some feature of the stimulus which is strong, that strongly affects the, uh, the effect of a cell, we might want to plot how strongly the cell uh, response as a function of that feature while we keep everything else fixed. So in this case, we keep fixed the position of the bar, the intensity of the bar, and so on, and we just vary its orientation. Okay, um, now one can measure tuning curves not only in sensory areas, one can also measure tuning curves in other cases where you can relate 
the firing rate to some variable that you can measure. So the other extreme case, which is easy, is so sensory areas are one end of the you know, one one um, interface of our brain with the world. This is where the way our brain receives information. So if we go to the other end, if we go to the motor output of our brain, that's another interaction of our brain with the world. And we can relate, say, the firing rate of a neuron in an area which is related to motor action with action. So we can, say, train a monkey uh, to, to reach in different directions. One can train the monkey to reach in different directions and measure the firing rate of a neuron in the motor cortex as a function of the direction of reach. And this is a classic paper that showed that you get, in many cells, you get tuning curves that also look quite similar to this, where particular cells fire more when the monkey is reaching in particular directions. Does this mean that these neurons are encoding the direction of hand motion? Very big distance from these two things, because this is a very particular experiment where we train the monkey to do a very stereotyped motion. It would be much harder to understand what this cell does in a general uh, motion which is also dynamic in time and it can be very much more complex than just these particular reaching motions. Anyway, um, when we talk about um, multidimensional stimuli, as in the retina, as I, I just mentioned, that the, the stimulus, the visual stimulus is not just one variable, it's not the realization of a bar, it's the light intensity as a function of position on the retina, then it is convenient to define a concept which is called the receptive field. Now, very roughly speaking, this con concept sometimes is used in the way just to represent the fact that the particular cell in the retina responds to, to light in one particular area of the visual scene. So, a particular say, so actually maybe I should say just a few more words about the retina. Uh, so the retina, um, because it, we will discuss the retina in this course, um, the retina uh, is out, technically speaking, it's, it's outside our brain, but it's in many ways it's part of the central the nervous system is com very complicated uh, uh, neural network and it involves many types of cells and um, the first type of cell that, uh, that actually turns light into to, to electrical activity is called the photoreceptor but there are two additional stages before uh, of processing in the retina going from photoreceptors to cells that are called, called bipolar cells cells that are called ganglion cells, and the ganglion cells are the ones that send information through the optic nerve to our brain, okay? And the ganglion cells are spiking. So you can characterize, if you look at the, what activates a particular photoreceptor or a particular ganglion cell, you would find that either one of these types of cells is active only when you shine light in a particular area of the visual scene. And sometimes, so sometimes when we say receptive field, that's what we mean, but ma more mathematically, we often mean something a bit more elaborate. So for example, if you look at the ganglion cell, one particular ganglion cell, and you try to shine various patterns of light on the retina and see what makes it fire, you find that it's, um, what it likes is to have strong activation in some region of the cell, and it will fire even more vigorously if you actually have decreased light intensity in some surrounding area. So this is called the center surround receptive field. The cell likes to fire when there is strong activation here and less activation in the... Uh, so for example, if you start with some background, uniform background, and you increase the intensity in this region, the cell will fire more. If you will decrease the intensity of this region, it, it, will, it will fire more. And actually what it likes the most is you do both. If you increase the intensity here and decrease the intensity here. And there's also the, a dynamic component which I'm not going into. Now we're just at discussing the spatial structure of the stimulus. So mathematically, we can try to model what determines the firing rate of a, a, a ganglion cell as a function of, of the stimulus. And now the stimulus is not just one variable. It's a, it's a multidimensional stimulus. It's the light intensity as a function of position of the retina. Okay? And one type of model which is captured not extremely well, but pretty well the response of the ganglion cells in the retina is to say the following. We should take this light intensity, multiply it by some function, okay? Do an integral. So all this is a linear operation, right? 
And that passes through some nonlinearity, a little bit similar to what we discussed before, the, the, the relationship between an input to the cell, the spiking input to a cell and its output. But here the input is not spikes of other cells, it's just we're relating the activity of the ganglion cell to the light intensity. So there's this linear relationship that goes through some nonlinearity, which has the same property as we discussed before. This nonlinearity, obviously the firing rate of the ganglion cell cannot be negative, and it's, it's, some, it's a monotonic function of the input. And you can fit, you can ask what is the best choice of f of x that will best fit the response of a ganglion cell to a very set of stimuli that you provide to it. So it's a kind of standard these days, it's not very standard way to characterize this is to uh, show to the retina some movie which is, say, flickering random noise. So everything is constantly changing and then record the activity of the ganglion cell and ask what is the best fit, what is the best form of this function f of x that would describe the best, would explain the best the firing rate of the cell as a function of the fluctuating input that we give to it. So here I showed you only spatial dependence, but there's also this temporal dependence. Ganglion cells like to fire more to changes in intensity rather than uh, just fixed intensity. So this can be this concept can be generalized to also to a temporal receptivity. But in, in any case for this particular ganglion cell, which is just sketched here in the car temperature, this f of x would be positive in this region, it would be negative in this region, and it would be zero far away from the, from the area to which this ganglion cell is responsible. Okay? So this is the concept of a receptive field. It's important to, under, to remember that the concept, the, the detailed concept of the receptive field is some function that kind of tells us what is, what is combination of the input to make the cell fire. A, is dependent on how we model the response of the cell. It's, an, it has, it's, it's difficult to define in a very clear-cut manner what is the receptive field of the cell because this f of x gets its meaning from our particular model that we use here for the relationship between the input and the output. It's what is called the linear nonlinear model. It's the linear summation of the input followed by a single nonlinearity, which we have to choose. Now, if we would model the ganglion cell response using a more elaborate model, it might still involve some combination of the stimuli, but the combination might end up looking a little bit different. Anyway, this is the concept. Uh, yes. Uh, can you repeat this point? Mm -hmm. Yes. That um, look, this is this is an idealization of what a ganglion cell in the retina does. It's not correct. It's 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 a an approximation, right? So the approximation again is that if you I, if I would tell you what is the light intensity as a function of space. Uh, could be generalized also to time. You would take this equation and it will tell you what is the firing rate of the cell. Okay? Once we decide that this is our idealization, we can choose, look for this function, which will explain best the data given this model. Okay? But we could come up with a much more elaborate model. For example, we could model you know, the response of, of ganglions of, uh, of photoreceptors and model the, all the biophysics of the connection between photoreceptors to bipolar cells, interconnection between bipolar cells, connection between bipolar cells to ganglion cells. We can do a very complicated network model of the retina and the res relationship between the response of that model to, to, uh, to, to the light intensity would be different from this, uh, from this simplified model. Now, in that model, maybe we can also end up with some concept of a of relationship between input and output similar to this receptive field, but it might not end up exactly being the same. So I, what my point is that this function f of x, um, when, you, when people tell you that you know, they measure the receptive field of a cell, you should always remember that it's not a, um, it's not a, um, a is something which is a real clear biophysical property of the cell. It depends on how we model the relationship, with how we model the activity of the cell. Okay? If we would use a somewhat different model, maybe we would end up also, with, which would still involve some combination of the inputs that determines the output, maybe we would end up with also with a different measurement of what is the receptive field. But this, tells us, but this is still a very useful uh, way to, to model the response of, of cells because it's First of all, we know that in the, in the retina it captures quite well the responses, 
and it tells us how to, in a simple way, how to, to take this very high dimensional quantity, the light intensity, and translate it to something that we can visualize and tell us what makes the cell fire. So if we do this fit in these experiments that I described, we get functions that look like this, that are you know, plus positive in some region and negative in some, in some region around it, that this really tells us something about the essence of what the cell is doing. The cell likes to respond to a situation in which there's more light in the center of its receptive field than in the periphery of its receptive field. Anyway, so um, th these are just some concepts that we discussed so far, neuron, dendrite, axon, synapse, spikes. I didn't use the term action potential, but I'm sure you all have heard about it. It's just the same. Uh, rate model, we discussed rate model of uh, neural dynamics, tuning curves, uh, and receptive field. So what I want to do next is to talk just a little bit about uh, the field of research that um, I'm part of. Many researchers in NSEC are just to a large extent see themselves as part of this uh, research field, which is called computational neuroscience. And um, um, the, the actually the term in English is very confusing, computational neuroscience, because it's interpret it can be interpreted in two different ways and is interpreted in two different ways. Some people use this term to uh, talk about um, research in which you use computational tools to understand the brain. Okay, so if you use math in your research, if you use a, a, a mathematical model or you use the computer to, to do your research, it's computational neuroscience, and if you don't, it's not computational neuroscience. That's the le but that's the, the less common use of this term and not the term the way that I uh, that I think about it. When I say computational neuroscience, and this is, by the way, the translation to Hebrew, which is the second meaning, it's not the use of computational tools to understand the brain, it's trying to understand the brain as a computational uh, machine, trying to understand the brain as, a, as something that does, as a, an object that does computations. So this is, of course, much wider because it encompasses not only theoretical tools, it encompasses also a lot of experimental and mostly experimental research but again, the focus is trying to understand the brain uh, from a computational perspective, and this is, to a large extent, uh, the center and the, uh, and the, the, the core of, the, of, of also the teaching program that you're in, right? Okay, so um, so this is computational neuroscience, uh, and of course, most of us believe that much of the computation that the brain does is not done at the level of a single neuron. Okay? Of course, neurons are themselves complicated objects, and you, there are a lot of uh, uh, intricacies uh, that you can study and, and they take part in, in performing computations. Nevertheless, there are a few examples where the kind of computations that we think about, I'll, I'll mention a few in, uh, in a moment, are done by a single neuron. They are done by a collection of neurons, and therefore, and maybe even a collection of brain areas. So therefore, often the, the, the focus in, in computational neuroscience is not at a, at a single neuron, but at the systems level, at many collections of many neurons. Okay, this uh, leads me to talk a little bit about scales in the human brain, just to bring out some of the challenges in, in doing so. So I, I'm starting here from large scale and we'll go to small scale. So we discussed the length of axons uh, um, of some neuron, and it can be one meter, so you know our spinal cord, that's the order of magnitude of its size, so you know, um, that's, that's kind of the largest scale that we have in our, in our central nervous system. Um, and um, then if we go to, to uh, let's talk about humans. So if we talk about our, our brain, this is just a picture, a depiction of the cortex, which is part of the brain. And, and okay, so we went down in size uh, maybe to an order of a few tens of centimeters. And roughly speaking, the cortex, as you probably have already heard, is can be divided into you know, the frontal lobe, the, the uh, uh, the occipital lobe, parietal lobe, temporal lobe, which have some commonality, some common functions, uh, each one of these parts. But then if you look into more detail, you find that there are regions in the brain which, based on many experiments, are associated with certain functions. So there's a part, actually the whole, this, this whole part in the back of our brain is, is dealing mostly with vision, Inside it, we can we'll talk about it in a moment. We can find some subdivisions, and then there's an area responsible for hearing, an area responsible for smell. 
So for one thing, this tells us that the non-trivial fact, which is just come empirical, that there is certain locality in the brain, that different brain regions seem to deal with particular functions, but also we were just discussing scale, so the scale of this, you know, this one of these areas um, uh, is maybe 10 centimeters, so I call this here a system, an area of the brain which deals with vision, an area of the brain that deals with auditory inputs, an area of the brain that deals with uh, um, decision making. And, uh, and then within these brain areas, suppose that we focus on the, on the visual cortex. Within these brain areas, we find something which I will call here a map. Um, how is a map in, in the visual cortex? The visual cortex is the area which is where it's the easiest to define this concept. And the idea is that you find that many of the visual areas have a what is called a retinotopic uh, organization. That a close by cells tend to represent some information about close by positions on the retina. And so you can provide stimuli to the retina and see what area of, the, of this visual cortex covers the whole visual field. And you find that you find one such map in, in the primary visual cortex, but then you find additional areas where each one of them covers the whole, uh, the whole, uh, the whole visual scene. Okay, so this is what I call a map. But there are analogies to this also in, uh, in say, um, in, in other brain areas, motor cells covering of the different senses, uh, the different uh, br uh, body parts. All right, now uh, we were, but we are talking about uh, uh, length scale, so we went from one meter, 10 centimeters, one centimeter. Uh, then everything that I'm saying here is a bit fuzzy, but, but in the cortex, we find that there's another important rough scale, which is a scale of what I would call a local network, and what is sometimes called the cortical column. And this has to, uh, uh, is manifested in, in two different ways. One is functional, that if you, um, if I do the Hubble and Friedel experiment and, um, and, uh, and, and change the orientation of the bar, you would find that in the visual cortex, neurons within a region of order one millimeter, maybe a little bit less, uh, uh, are respond all of them are responsive to the same orientation. And then if you move a little bit more, you will find neurons that are responsive to another orientation. So this is one thing that functionally, or, or one particular area in the visual scene. So functionally, neurons within this scale are have similar response properties. Okay, and 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 the other thing is that connectivity over this scale, connectivity is very dense. Neurons tend to make many connections to 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 neurons in within this area, which is sometimes called the cortical column. They also have there are also projections which are longer scale, uh, but uh, but uh, but one millimeter seems to be a, 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 a an important scale. Now this actually relates. I don't know if I wanted to do this now or a bit later. Um, maybe I'll, I'll do this now I, to a question that I asked you before, which is um, uh, what why I mean I mentioned to you that the the uh, size of dendrites is about one millimeter. And so maybe that's a good time to, to just uh, ask why that's the case. I mean, it, I could, we could have done it before. So do, do, does anyone know why that's, uh, why that's the uh, typical size of dendrites? Most of them don't have any actual Yes, okay, so? So it's very difficult to convey information. I mean, So the problem is not so much time, I think. The problem is decay. decay. D did you discuss in some course the cable equation? Uh, right, so the ca cable equation really tells us what is the length scale over which uh, the signal decays in linear uh, propagation in, in, the, in the dendrite. And, and, and that turns out to be that's the order of magnitude. So it's just beyond, if you would try to generate a, a, pa a passive uh, the propagation uh, over a length of meter will just not work. The signal will decay. Exponential decay means that beyond the, the characteristic length, you get nothing. So, so, so that's the reason why dendrites have this order of magnitude, and maybe that's also the reason why why this is an important length scale in the structure of the cortex. Um, anyway, um, 
after talking about, ah, we continue to talk about scale, so local networks are one millimeter, but there are additional smaller scales in the brain, of course, so the neurons themselves, right? So the neurons are the soma of the cell, not the, the dendrites and the axons, the soma of the cell, the cell body, like typical biological cells, like, I don't know, 10 to 100 micron, uh, and then we can go into, deep into the cell itself, it has additional scales in it, the scale of the synapse, and the synapse itself is composed of various molecules, so, you know, uh, smaller proteins can be one nanometer. The ion channel is a fairly complex uh, cons construct pro which involves several proteins, but that's like the, the typical the characteristic size is uh, uh, a few nanometers. So what I point out, what I point out here is that just, you know, if you look at the brain, it has many, many scales in it going from several orders of, many, many orders of magnitudes of scale, 10 orders of magnitude, going from one meter to one nanometer. Um, now, in many ways, even though we will not even be biological enough in this course to discuss, you know, often, we will, we will often not, not discuss where exactly we think that a uh, uh, certain neural computation that we're modeling in a network is being done in the brain, we will often not discuss that, but we, but that we, we and the kind of computations and the or kind of networks that we'll talk about conceptually map into probably this level, that the local networks in the brain, groups of neurons that are interconnect strongly interconnected and are involved together in some computation. Okay. Uh, now discuss length scales, so let's discuss time scales. So um, of course many, many different time scales. I will start from the time scale of an action potential, which is one millisecond, but of course there are many, there are much shorter time scales related to the opening and closing of ion channels, uh, which I'm not explicitly writing here. Uh, we discussed the fact that the integration time of a membrane, that the, the, the time, you know, once a spike, uh, 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 ah, no, the membrane we didn't discuss. So, okay, so, so if you perturb the membrane potential of a cell, you can ask how much time it would take until it will go back to baseline. That's a few milliseconds, 10 is maybe too long, but a few milliseconds. Um, synaptic integration time we discussed, once a spike arrives at the synapse, what is the time scale over which the voltage in the postsynaptic cell or the current in the postsynaptic cell is affected by the fact that the, the, the synapse was activated? So the, the, the typical time scales range between one millisecond to 100 milliseconds, depending on the type of the synapse. Um, now we know that there are other processes that uh, happen uh, uh, um, that have longer time scores. So, so for example, once a synapse is activated, it might be uh, either in, uh, potentiated or, 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 or uh, suppressed for a while, and the typical time scales over this, this is, so this is called short-term synaptic plasticity, and the typical time scales for that are between 100 milliseconds and a few seconds maybe. And, uh, but we also know that there are processes, much slower processes, in which the strength of synapses are the, struct the structural connections between neurons are, are, are modified, and the strength of synapses are changing. And this can happen over a wide range of time scales, as shown here. And the outcome, we believe, of long term synaptic plasticity uh, is memories, some of which are. Lasting uh, lifetimes, right? So, so we have, we believe that memories are encoded in long term structural changes in the brain, but we know that the time scale of memories, we, that at least we have, humans have, this time constant. So there are many, many different time scales uh, here, and, uh, and they're not uh, completely, you no, know, they're not very well separated from each other. The, uh, the synaptic integration time, short time synaptic plasticity, longer than synaptic integration. This makes analysis of neural systems um, more complicated than some, some systems in same physics where you have very clear time separation between processes that are fast and processes that are much slower. Nevertheless, often when we model, say, plasticity in the brain, we make the assumption that plasticity is happening on a very much longer time scale than the time scale of the activity and the time scale of the activation of the synapses. And that can help in, in understanding what, what, what are the consequences. Okay, I talked a bit about time scales. I want to talk a little bit about numbers of neurons. Um, so, um, 
probably the most simple uh, animal which is model or model um, organism which is used in uh, neuroscience is the elegant. Um, Filigans, as you might know, has a, a completely stereotypical uh, a body plan. Okay, all the cells have a name. They're the same in any, any two individuals, and this is true also for the neurons. So it has 302 neurons, and each one of them has a, has a name. And the connections between them are stereotyped. And the number of synapses is about 5,000. So this means that the, every cell makes about you know, on average, 16 synapses to other cells. Let's continue to more to, lar to more complex nervous systems. So I'm, I mean, I'm just going through the, you know, the, ma the main model systems used in biology. So Drosophila, fruit fly, we have here um, two orders of magnitude increasing the number of neurons, 100,000. And one thing that you can notice is that also the, the synapse number of synapses has increased but the ratio between the number of synapses and neurons has also increased. Here it was about 15, here it's 100, right? And if we go to a mouse, then we have a factor of 1,000 in the number of neurons and a factor of um, 10,000 in the number of synapses. So now each cell on average makes 1,000 synapses uh, to, to other cells and uh, if we continue to humans, then um, it's even larger. So, so okay, another factor of a thousand in the number of cells. The average number of synapses is somewhere in between a thousand and ten thousand, a few thousand synapses per cell. Okay, so both the number of neurons is increasing and the number of synapses that each neuron is making. Um, if we focus just on the on the cortex, then it's about a 20% of the neurons in our brain are in the cortex, um, and, um, and order of magnitude of 10,000 connections per cell. Um, and just if we go back to the level of a single cortical column, whatever that means, order of magnitude of one millimeter by one millimeter by the few millimeters of the thickness of the cortex, um, that contains about 10 to the four neurons. So it's a, a little bit less than the fruit fly uh, brain. Um, ten cortical columns would be like the fruit fly brain. Um, what else did I want to say uh, about this? Ah, um, just um, this is uh, just not yesterday that I will mention this. But if you look at these numbers. Um, you can ask yourself, uh, suppose that uh, uh, you, know, you, you have, let's say, take C. elegant. You have 302 neurons, and each one of them is making about 16 synapses. So you can ask yourself how much information uh, you would need to, uh, I would need to give you in order to specify the connectivity. Let's do the connectivity not at the level of strength of synapses, but just which neuron is connected to which neuron. And this is what people are trying to do in connect most in connect you can do the math and, and figure out how many bits of information they would need to provide to you in order to specify all the connections from every neuron to, to every neuron. And it's an interesting, it's a nice exercise to do. You can try to do it because then you will see that for silicons it's not a lot and it, it could easily be uh, represented in the genome of the animal, which in fact it is because we know that every two animals have exactly the same, the same connectivity. But if you go up from around Drosophila, I think, and upwards, Drosophila is still kind of borderline if you try to do just this very rough exercise, asking how many bits would be required to define, to define all the connections and comparing that to the size of the genome. Or for all these animals, you clearly see that it, that it cannot work. And you would need, if, if every neuron can be connected to every neuron, uh, and you would need the number of bits that you would need to represent it is, is much too large to be represented in the genome, which tells us one of two things. It tells us first that the organization might be much more, uh, there, there might be some rules in the organization which would mean that you could represent this information in more compact form than just, uh, than just you know, saying it independently which neuron is connected to which neuron. And the other thing is that 
we don't think that you know that, that the brain of two in human individuals is the same. The wiring up in in, in, in humans, but also in, in, in certainly in mice, is very experience dependent. Okay, so which just means that plasticity, which we're going to discuss a lot in this course, plays a very important role, at least in in our brain, in the mammal brains, in, in setting up the connectivity. Um, okay, so the the reason I I mentioned these length scales and time scales and numbers is, is just to highlight some of the challenges in in the brain research in, at the systems level, and the, the I think the biggest one of the challenges is that we have we're dealing with collective dynamics of, of many many. Computational units. Each one of these units is a comp the neur a neuron is a complex, uh, complicated uh, object. And there is a vast range of temporal and spatial time scales, which are somehow all related to, to each other in various ways, and they're sometimes overlapping. And there's structure, there's structure on all scales, uh, and much of it is unknown. So we base our when we try to model uh, computation in the brain, we base what we do on, on very rough knowledge which is coming from broad anatomy, from activity of particular nodes, but we certainly don't know uh, right now almost in any area of the brain what is the detailed connectivity between all the neurons. Um, and all this means that uh, it's a very uh, difficult question to even decide what details are important in order to highlight some principles. What level of description is important? Can we, can we use the kind of great models that I wrote down earlier in order to understand something about brain function, or is it necessary to model uh, ion channels in every cell? Not, not, not a there's no clear answer to these questions. Um, now, um, to a large extent, um, um, what differs, so some of these challenges, for example, the fact that we need to understand the collective dynamics of many cells are challenges that are found also in other disciplines. So for example, in physics, uh, the discipline that I come from, in condensed matter physics, we, we um, learn how to deal with systems that contain 10 to the 23 atoms or molecules. Okay? And, and statistical physics, condensed matter physics, developed many, many tools that are very useful to understand these, these, these systems. And some of these tools are even useful for understanding the brain. But there is a big difference between system studies in physics and chemistry and, 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 and biology, and this is function. So uh, the fact that, that, in my mind, the, uh, in, in the biological system, evolution has uh, shaped the system in many, many different ways in order to achieve a certain function. And one of the d reasons that all these difficulties become even more s highlighted in biology, I think, than in physics, is that evolution doesn't care about, you know, it's free to work at all scales. It doesn't have some some guideline that's telling it to find a solution by changing something at the scale of the whole brain or at the scale of this particular neuron. It's free to work on all scales and it does it on all scales. And, and that makes the system, the, the relationship between the dis dis different scales, the single neuron, the, sy the mass, the system, the brain, very complicated. What is the function in, in the brain? Um, well, the point of view that we will take, that we take in our field of research, computational uh, systems neuroscience, is that the function of the brain is that of com primarily computation and processing of information. You can argue with that, but uh, that that's the point of view that we're taking. Okay, uh, what else do I want to say? So, um, what are kind of computations that the brain performs? So this is just kind of a rough list of types of computations sensory perception, and we can, in a particular experimental context, we can uh, relate that to more concrete questions of ability to discriminate between some stimuli or recognized object, for example. Uh, decision making, generation of motor actual, uh, creation of memories, the goal of the memory is help us, is really to help us make decisions uh, later on in our life based on the information that we gather. Uh, uh, learning and okay, you can, you can try to think about even higher levels of, uh, of uh, computation, which are language, creativity, and so on. And one thing that I want to emphasize is that information uh, plays a very central role in all these processes, right? 
uh, and it will also play an important role in the scores. So it plays a role in representing what information about the world is represented by activity in the brain. And the brain might need to decide to extract some features of the, of the input that it receives from the world and discard others. The brain needs to relay information from one brain area to another, and the brain needs to store information in the form of memories. Um, okay, now um, learning. I, I just want to um, uh, mention that the term learning is used in neuroscience in a, in a somewhat funny way because it's sometimes it means um, what we kind of uh, intuitively, use in ordinary uh, um, uh, language mean when we say learning, but sometimes it's the same term is used to describe processes that are just what we think is the mechanistic underpinning of learning, which is plasticity. And so we believe that, you know, that uh, uh, learning involves long-term changes in the connectivity of the brain, which, strictly speaking, should be called plasticity, but sometimes people use the term learning just to describe that. The fact that something is changing the structure of the neural network. And and if we talk about, uh, but about learning from the functional point of view, learning something about the world, I want to make a very important distinction, which will be important in this course. It's a kind of broad, rough distinction between, I'm taking into extremes, between two types of learning. One is supervised and one is unsupervised. So supervised learning is a situation where uh, I provide to you many examples and say, suppose you need to categorize uh, uh, some sensory input into two categories. And I provide to you many examples, but I also tell you what is the label associated with each one of them. Okay, so that's supervised learning. We need to learn something about this association. Unsupervised learning would be a situation in which I provide you, say, many images of cats and dogs. I never tell you that this is a cat, this is a dog, but by just observing this, your brain realizes that there are two categories here. Okay? So this would be an example of unsupervised learning. Um, I think that uh, I actually went today a bit more slowly because I did all this than I did last year, so I didn't finish the presentation, but we need to, uh, let me just verify. Yeah, we need to finish for today. So I will finish this uh, presentation uh, on Thursday. Thank you.